it's important to like really stay like centered and grounded in why you started. We're vessels, um, a conduit of the work that we do, right? And like, it like is a, you have to like remind yourself like every day, like, cause there are challenges that come, there's wins that come and there's highs and lows that come with entrepreneurship, but like kind of going back to your why. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Mpomonto, and our goal and mission with the show is to introduce you to active change makers who we believe are the next generation of thought leaders in their respective fields, right? Our esteemed guest for this episode is formerly known as Nataya Walker, who's the founder of a nonprofit called Seeds for Fortune, built on a mission to assist girls of color to access college scholarships, applications, and even teach them about the basics of financial literacy. Additionally, she is a graduate of Babson College and is currently based in New York and over the course of her journey has been featured on platforms such as the Huffington Post, Black Enterprise, the prestigious Forbes 30 Under 30 and in 2020 was named the One Young World Deloitte Scholar, uh, a milestone in her uh, social entrepreneurship journey that will indeed act as a, cat as a catalyst and accelerate the growth trajectory within her body of work. On that note, think of active change makers who are shifting the needle in terms of ensuring access to education amongst minority groups. Think of Nitia Walker and her team at the Seeds for Fortune organization. Without any further ado, Nitia, welcome to the Leaders Podcast. Hello, how are you? <laughs> it's great to, to have you here, Nataya. Um, and, and I think it's the first time I've met you. I've heard a lot about you as a current Babson student. Um, and part of me feels like I'm walking through in the right footsteps, uh, knowing that there are such people in our alumni base doing work that you are doing. Um, yeah, and I think before we even delve into your episode, you know, um, given that it's the first time I've met you, I'm quite just out of curiosity of how 2021 has been for you, um, what it's meant for you. You on a personal level, on a, on a business wise, I know that we are moving in the latter parts, you know, of the, of the pandemic as everybody's getting vaccinated. But just curious on how you've been um, in terms of your headspace and just on a personal level. Yeah, so 2021 has gone by so fast. Like Q1 was like here and then it wasn't. It's a really big time of execution and building for our organization. We had a lot of growth in 2020 and we're executing on that growth in 2021. Yeah. Um, so we're pretty excited to see where um, we kind of end up towards the end of the year. Mm. Mm. And, I, and I guess talking about 2021 and talking about growth, um, uh, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is that with the with the recent threat, you know, of the recent strain of the COVID-19 uh, virus cre creating havoc across the nation's education system, you know, how has your organization managed to navigate, you know, these trying times? Yeah, definitely. So in our initial accept inception in 2014, we were a scholars program, we're in-person scholars program. So we would take in a certain amount of cohort of students every year, train them on how to think about money and scholarships and their future. And then we would um, graduate in another cohort. Um, <laughs> but we see that from here that um, maybe like in 2017, 2018, that we had a high application pool, but we could mm -hmm. only accept a certain amount of students into our program. Mm -hmm. So with that, we I started to do like virtual conferences and things like that um, for Seeds of Fortune, but the technology just wasn't there. And then in 2019, um, they started to be like a high demand for like module activities and building community forums and things of that nature. And I decided that I wanted to make um, Seeds of Fortune an ed tech platform. So like right when the pandemic hit, we were like pretty well positioned to be able to help young women online through their college process. Mm -hmm. 
And I guess re- really talking about that, one thing I found so profound from various articles in preparation for this interview is how you have seemed to be somebody who has led this organization with quite an optimistic outlook, you know, at the time again, where the pandemic, where everybody is expecting, you know, for, for their programs. And I guess you all, you have your own fair share of challenges um, that you have experienced. But I think one common thread that I was, you know, came across while, while just getting into your space it's just this the sense of optimistic outlook um, despite what is happening you know and I'm really quite curious also just as you are you've chosen to lead this organization on a personal level what are some of the challenges you faced you know in the pandemic um that when you look back you really astonished at how you've overcome them yeah so during the pandemic when we were launching the platform um the schools shut down. So typically how we would recruit students is through the college um, guidance counselors. And um, with the students being out of touch with their guidance counselors, it kind of disrupted our ability to be able to reach students that we typically would be able to connect with. So we decided to create like a competition amongst the students Um, that allowed them to recruit their friends to the platform. So, yeah. So then um, we were able to do it more peer to peer where the girls were able to invite their friends to the platform to be able to um, get the information and experiences Mm. um, that way. Because Mm. it wasn't until later that fall that we were able to really get back in touch with the high schools and the guidance counselors to be able to share our opportunities with them. And I'm guessing that that might have really turned turned quite well. And I think in terms of your your pool, your most recent pool with the pandemic, I think having that model of of asking your current cohort to to recruit must have really worked quite well. Which really gets me thinking about. Um, I had a when looking into really thinking about you know the origins of seeds of fortune, and I thought that you know. I was quite interested in what series of events, personal events, you know, propelled you to start your program. I know you started it in the latter years of your time at Babson, but I was also just quite curious at, at that at what point in your life did you decide that this is the niche that I want to focus on and one way in which I want to contribute um, to Black girls of color, but just really empowering uh, Black girls of power. Yeah, definitely. So like around the end of my tenure at Babson, like I had gotten a scholarship to go to Babson, the Posse Leadership Scholarship. And before I got to Babson, I had desired to get the Future Woman of Distinction Scholarship, which was provided by the Girl Scouts mm-hmm. of um, Great New York. And they also have a national version of it as well. Yeah. And only one girl in New York City could get the scholarship. So I knew it was pretty competitive. Mm-hmm. So I... Um, found out from a young woman in my Girl Scout troop who had reached the finals and also got $150,000 to go to Spelman, which is an all black women's college, um, how she kind of went through her journey. And she let me know that her mom um, helped to package her for college Hmm. and college scholarships. Hmm. So with that, I asked her to like work with me and she did. And she helped me to prepare myself for the interview and to be considered as a top candidate um, for like six weeks the summer yeah. going into my year of high school. And I ended up getting that scholarship and the Posse scholarship among other scholarships. But I really started to figure out that there was like a formula to um, kind of success, if that makes sense, and okay. being able to strategically navigate waters. Mm-hmm. And I going through the kind of higher education system, by the time I got to end the Babson, mm-hmm. I wanted to help other girls, especially since um, Babson is a predominantly white institution, mm-hmm. navigate um, the kind of waters of trying to go to college affordably if they wanted to go away or stay um, in their local like community college, things of that nature. I think what I what I found really peculiar and quite 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 unique about your story, Natalia, is that as somebody who is from South Africa, um, is that oftentimes when applying to even colleges in the US, right, as a person of color, just this whole thing that you know access, you know, that you might intellectually you feel like you might belong in certain spaces, but because of your inability to have the right funds or the right you know the right people to get you into those spaces. Oftentimes, you know, black girls of color and even um, 
don't have access to these spaces because of that. And which is why I really find the work that you're doing um, not only as a way as, of you impacting your community, but I think speaks to, to the power of how black women of color, just women in, in general, are the backbone of our societies. You know, listening to your answer now, I'm reminded of a, a quote by uh, the young uh, Malala Yousafzai, where she spoke about how education is the right for every child. And especially for all girls, you know, that to go forward as a society, we must ensure education towards girls, you know, um, and, and I'm really interested and inspired um, by the work that you're doing. On that note, I'm quite also curious about what have been some of your highlights, you know, and inflection points. So I know we started off with, you know, how you've navigated the pandemic. But overall, since you started in your latter years at Babson, you looking back and now in hindsight, what did you say are some of your, your highlights? and inflection points in your journey thus far? Yeah, I would say that my first um, seed cohort graduating from college was like a big highlight for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when they were like 16 or 17 years old and they like to see them go all the way to like 22, 23. Mm. I like literally have an award ceremony every year called Seed to Bloom Awards. Wow. And um, it... At that awards ceremony, we like, you know, honored them for graduating from college. And I just like couldn't believe like we had taken like this kind of five to six year journey together. Yeah. Um, they like helped build the organization, gave mm -hmm. input. They helped me create the um, programs, give feedback. Um, and to watch them become women was just like a really exciting um journey for us as an organization. So I would say that was like one of my inflection points. Yeah. Um, and to that like this small thing that we had built um, had um, started to impact um, hundreds of girls by that point in time was just like overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. This episode is sponsored by our friends at the Leaders Journal. Are you a writer or perhaps looking for a premium self-help blog? Then you should click the link below to check out on insights about the work that they do and how you can contribute to the Leaders Journal. I believe that there's absolutely no way to build an empowering mindset without taking some time to actually reflect and think about how we can actively and practically execute on our purpose. And I think taking some time to read self-help articles um, is often one way in which I've found ways to figure out what other young people are doing and how I can actively change my perception and therefore the way I live. Therefore, I want to recommend a blog that I read once a week called The Leader's Journal which is a platform that consists of concise and clearly laid out content that is palatable for anyone looking for practical ways in which they can improve the outlook of their days as they unpack some of the core principles of mostly highly effective individuals across the globe. Make sure you don't miss out on this one guys. Click the link below and check out The Leader's Journal. Enjoy the episode. And I, and I guess t talking about about impact, you know, I really want to make sure that whoever would be listening to this episode fully understands what you stand for, because I think personally, not only do I believe in the work that you're doing, but I think your work resembles what a generational change looks like. You know what 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 really ensuring that young people of color have access to spaces can do not only for their families or their communities, but just for for, for society and the development of society. So I know having looked through your work, that you've got this notion of financial literacy, right? Which often struck me um, through the various articles um, published about the work that you're doing. And I really wanted to ask you that, given that this is such an integral component of, of, of what you're about, why do you feel um, that financial literacy is important um, to be taught to girls of color? I think that financial literacy is essential to be taught to girls of color because um, managing your finances is like essential to life. Like money yeah. is not everything, but you definitely <laughs> need money to be able to survive. And statistically in the United States, particularly um, black, Latin, Latinx, and um, particularly immigrant populations are far behind the wealth gap. Mm. So a lot of times conversations about money are not being had in households, mm. or you just like don't know from generation to generation. Mm. So like our motto is to make 
the un- uncomfortable comfortable and through the college process where you have to talk about financial aid, where you finally find out how much your parents make, um, when a lot of conversations about money are coming up to be to intercept into those conversations and really lay out the foundation. It was because I went to um, my church had like an internship program and part of the internship program, we had to take financial literacy classes. Yeah. And that's how I learned about student loan debt. Mm. And sometimes and then the ramifications that having debt can have on you building future wealth. And that's why I was like so cognitive of it of it as a teenager going into college. And it was something that I didn't want to take on. Mm. And for me, I think that it's not enough conversations are happening around it. Like, especially education is seen as a socioeconomic um, uplift to the next social class, but they don't talk about how, you know, almost in the United States costs like $80,000 from one of the most, like, no, the prestigious, very, um, um, I wouldn't say prestigious, some of them, but um, (laughs) the most expensive colleges are now like 80,000, of course, like on a more local level, maybe seven, eight, $10,000 $10,000 now. And it's not just an educational investment. It's a financial investment as well. And I think that because in the United States, education is free for most of your life. If you decide to go to a public school system from K through 12, it's kind of just seemed like, oh, okay, like just another educational step. But when you graduate, you have so many student loans and you're just trying to navigate. You might want certain freedoms. If you're creative, you might want to be able to travel and just like create art but then you have like these student loans that you have to pay back or you want to like in three or four years after graduation start a family mm-hmm. and then you're like okay like we have this new like wedding kids student loan it's like your little friend that's following you wherever you go it, it kind of also speaks to to why the the work that you're doing is important because i think through that they're able to kind of br- break the cycle um because you you grow up um <laughs> you you take a student loan you you get access to this to this education which is brilliant you get a job start a family but then you realize that you need to pay this but also your kids at some point will be in the same space in which they do need to access tertiary education um and as a parent you might not be well prepared um to to have prepared a trust fund for them to then have access to education without a student loan so i think the work that you're doing um you know i think allows them to kind of in one way or the other break that cycle you know as you said for them to kind of do whatever that they set their mind to uh, without any financial burden um and and just really, as they say, in the world is your oyster for them to just <laughs> do whatever makes them feel purpose led and, and purposeful. I really want to also delve into the crux of your work. So you spoke about the intersection of financial independence, but also education. So as somebody who I'm just I just want to make sure that this is practical to anybody who might be listening um, is that. If I'm a, if I'm a girl, let's say I'm from New York, I'm a black girl of color, I'm applying to this program. I want yeah. you to kindly run me through the process. What does the program look like? Um, it doesn't have to be entirely detailed, but just just for somebody to have a sense of what you are actually doing. Do you get these? Do they do the do the girls of color apply? And then um, are they matched to college counselors? What does the process actually look like? Um, and how do you guys ensure that even after they've graduated, that you constantly build in this alumni network of uh, seeds for fortune women? Yeah. So um, if a young lady wants to join our program, she'll typically find out about it from a friend, from the internet, yeah. from a guidance counselor at school. And then she will register on our website for our platform. Within yeah. a week, she would be approved or um, asked for further verification or information about herself to be yeah. able to join the network. And then she has access to these live to these modules yeah. that go step there are about six to eight of them that go step yeah. by step in the process of um, college and scholarship um, packaging of yourself yeah. and then also <laughs> financial literacy. Hmm. Um, on top of that, we, they are teenagers, so we do have live sessions for them to be oh, able okay. to move together as a digital cohort. Um, so they have six or seven of those that take them through the college and scholarship application process, um, hone in on financial literacy, 
Mm. And then um, they graduate from our program, um, yeah. but they continue to um, provide be provided resources such as internships, scholarship updates, um, really making sure that their um, community is really being um, fostered. And mm. then once they graduate from high school, they have the option to join our university program mm. that's focused on getting them internships, leadership opportunities, as well as um, continuing to foster the financial literacy component um, of our program until they graduate from college. It does indeed. It does indeed sound sound quite robust. And I'm guessing as somebody who has went through the process, it allows you to even better lead your team because you kind of know the kinks of, of what really matters and which components are important in, in assisting uh, most of the girls in your cohort. I'm quite curious also, uh, Nataya, as somebody who's leading this organization, um, as somebody who is who has taken the challenge or the bait and to really impact society or impact your community through helping girls of color. I'm quite curious about how do you pour into your cup? You know, what do you do for your self-development uh, to keep your mind active, learning and growing? Do you read? Um, yeah. How, how do you, what's your journey in terms of your self-development? Yeah, so I typically will do devotionals every day. It's so funny I asked this question. Um, <laughs> on the panel, I was on a couple of days ago, but um, yeah. I've like really started in the habit of doing daily devotionals to like yeah. really feed my cup. I am a Christian, so like I have a lot of like faith based um, like podcasts that I listen to mm -hmm. and music to keep my inner zen. <laughs> <going>. <laughs> around people that fill my cup like I like have a f I feel like I have an amazing friend group around me that continuously like we try to pour into each other especially like when things are challenging yeah. or you're like oh my god what did I get myself? <laughs> yeah. and also like the um, power of a positive mindset um, it, it cannot be um, talked about enough like for me, um, it's so funny. Like when I was a kid, I went to like Christian camp mm -hmm. and like they had this thing called the complaint rock. And every time like you would complain, you had to carry the rock around the campsite. Mm -hmm. And it just like taught me like the weight, like it was like a physical um, representation of the weight that negative energy and negative um thoughts can bring so like the symbolization of like you're weighing yourself down by like having these negative thoughts so like when you want to think about complaining not say you shouldn't complain because obviously <laughs> everybody's human and things of that nature but like how can you like reverse that thought and like make it into a positive one and I feel like it was like such a good lesson to learn at a young age I still have that rock to this day because <laughs> um, it just like showed me like symbolically but then also like physically because I had to actually carry around yeah. that rock <laughs> that like the, the weight of um bad vibes and bad energy can bring. So like, I feel like it really helped me to be like an optimistic and positive person. And I feel like that like helps to keep me like grounded day to day. And, and I think of, the, of this quote while listening to you um, that I think really encapsulates what you're talking about. Um, it's a quote by uh, Bishop T.D. Gates. Um, he goes like, it is not the movement of a clock that produces the newness of life. It is the movement in your mind which kind of speaks to the idea that oftentimes we would, we would equate that, uh, that the constant changing of time, that as we grow, that we are becoming better people. But his argument is that it is actually the renewal of your mind that allows you to have a, a better lived experience. Like you're able to, to shape your perceptions, as you say, through the power of your thoughts would then have an effect on your perceived reality, but also just more so your action. Um, so, so I think, thank you for that, because I think it really reminded me and I felt that him saying that really kind of encapsulates what you're talking about. This idea that fundamentally as human beings, we, we are constantly sending out energy into the universe, you know? Um, so I think I wish I had went, I wish I'd learned that lesson <laughs> at quite a young age. Maybe I could have accomplished what you've accomplished, um, <laughs> but it's great. It's great that I'm learning this now. <laughs> Uh, and you did quite well for yourself as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I guess, and do you do any reading? Um, are there any favorite books that you also read? Uh, constantly learning? Yeah, so I was a really big avid book reader. Like, 
when I had like a little bit more time on my hands, but I'm not as much anymore. But um, during our, we have two programs inside of Seeds of Fortune. So we have um, our scholars program that's now in partnership with Yale Women Economics that we teach um, girls online economics curriculum. And then we have our online um, network, which is um, more of our traditional programming of helping all girls to be able to learn financial literacy. Mm -hmm. But to get into the scholars program, you have to interview. Um, It's a pretty intensive interview process. And at the third round interview, um, you have to bring an object that represents yourself. And wow. one of the girls brought a book um, that I actually purchased. Um, and it's called <laughs> Bodega Dreams. Um, and um, we have a big, you know, we started as a uh, organization for Black women, but we have since over the years expanded to Latinx and um, Asian population. And the book talks about um, East Harlem. And it's a story written about the dreams of um, those that are trying to kind of it kind of like is a narrative of what's happening in the East Harlem community in a fictional way. But I have been reading it um, lately and I was like really inspired by the fact that she she basically said in her interview that there's not a lot of stories written about um, their experience, especially the New York experience of those yeah. in Spanish. Harlem Mm -hmm. and I and I am a very community oriented person and I always want to understand deeper about the neighborhoods that I serve Mm -hmm. um, within our platforms so I've really been enjoying that book and it's it's not like a self-help book or like a business book but it, it does have a lot of components of business to it and how communities work and how um communities can stay disenfranchised and how there's creative ways to empower your communities. And that's kind of like what I'm into right now. So. Wow. That, that, that's truly amazing. I think it really speaks to, you know, what you spoke about the idea of understanding community. But I think also one thing that you mentioned, it's kind of like how oftentimes we think how oftentimes we are often ignorant, you know, to communities that, that, that might not be in the same space as that. So taking a book to read about, you know, East Harlem, I guess a community that you might think you know, but allowing yourself to view it from a different lens or different lived experiences allows you to better understand the complexities of individuals in that in that community. I'm guessing. Um, so, so I think on the point of uh, self development, what would you say is your message to the world? I think this is like a common theme that's coming up in like um, all of the, the recent talks, but it's important to like really stay like centered and grounded in why you started like i was on a panel for the united nations on saturday morning all the days starting to blur together (laughs) and uh, one of the panelists they were just like we're not leaders right even though you're the leadership (laughs) (laughs) we're vessels we're vessels um uh, conduits of the work that we do right and like it like is a you have to like remind yourself like every day like because there are challenges that come there's wins that come and there's highs and lows that come with entrepreneurship but like kind of going back to your why and like what were you created to do and it's like also your work doesn't define you so like who are you outside of your work or maybe your work is an extension of you of of what of you but not like your whole entire being because like you can sometimes get um, caught up or overwhelmed and like you become this persona of a person, but it's really important to reaffirm yourself every day about your why and like reaffirm who you are as a person so that you can go out and do the work. I, th- I think it's quite interesting because it's, it's, it's something personally um, that I kind of struggled with this idea of, of identity, you know, am I the work that I'm doing? Or who is Mpo outside of what is this? So I think um, thinking about that and, and thinking about how you've navigated that um, gets me thinking, you know, about how, to, what, what it means to separate myself um, as an individual or as young people. You know, I think sometimes we are often stuck in doing that we forgot to be, you know, that, that we just forget to just simply be human. Um, and, and that often takes a toll on our relationships, on our family relationships, but also just the relationships with ourselves. Um, and I think what, what makes it harder, and I'm guessing this is me kind of asking for advice, you know, <laughs> um, 
to, to, one thing that I've also struggled a lot about is this idea of how do I find my voice, right? It's kind of like oftentimes on Instagram and social media or Netflix or whatever, you are, are constantly consuming information and there's so many voices coming in. And then one thing that I've been struggling about is, is how do I, as a young person, find my voice at least all of the noise. I know probably the first step you're going to say, okay, I'm for cut the noise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'm also just quite curious if, if, if you had some thoughts around that, what, what, what's looked at in you? Yeah, so I think it is really important to like monitor what you're filtering in to yourself. Um, so like me, like I actually also started a career in media and entertainment um, yeah. while I was building seeds. And I love TV. I love movies. Like. Yeah. I like worked um, in media for a, a couple of years yeah. and um, like, I felt like in March, like, you know, like sometimes TV can be like a distraction, you know, yeah. like it can be like a, it's an outlet. It's an escapism <laughs> um, type of thing. And, but I felt like it was a little too distracting. Mm-hmm. So like I have taken like a fast for a month of no TV. So mm-hmm. like sometimes I get, I can't watch YouTube though. So <laughs> I'll do like, like, like 45 minutes of YouTube or something like that. Like yeah. watching a show on YouTube, mm-hmm. but like, if it's not like a podcast or something like that, like it helps me to like recenter and reset. And like, you have to like intentionally like cut whatever noise might be like distracting you from your own thoughts sitting in silence um at times like the p- picking like what kind of music or what kind of people you're going to be around um i think it's like really important to be intentional about your energy because you just have but so much time mm. to be able to kind of execute and get things done so if there's things like weighing you down or um you're not spending enough time with you mm. to like re navigate your ship yeah then you're yeah. going like be kind of like on a boat, but like kind of floating abyss, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Just kind of like going with the flow. <laughs> yeah. Instead of you like more strategic about the waters that you're trying to chart. So sometimes it just takes a little bit of isolation mm-hmm. um, to kind of redirect yourself. And then all noise is not bad noise, but it's just like, what, what are you bringing in to your energy space? I love the fact that the advice is very practical and it's something that even post the podcast um, that myself and, and the other listeners can probably, you know, implement in their lives. On that note, how can our listeners and viewers stay in touch with the work that you're doing? Definitely. They can follow us at Seeds of Fortune um, on Instagram, on Facebook, <laughs> um, and then also visit our website, www.seedsoffortune.org um, to stay connected with us, sign up for our newsletter, um, feel free to donate. We have a book that just came out, um, Money in College, that can be donated to a girl within our um, organization. So. Wow, it's amazing. Right, guys, there you have it from Natalia Walker herself. Guys, go read and check about the work that she's doing on her social media pages. On our side, we will be sharing links to her respective um, websites um, or even social media pages once we release her episode. Once here at the Leaders Podcast, we believe that as more and more young people go conscious of their unique purpose, as they discover their hidden pearls, they essentially add value to society in the only way they can please remember to follow us on our youtube instagram twitter apple podcast google google podcast and spotify at the leaders podcast and if you enjoyed this episode if you enjoyed listening to natalia's voice um please remember to like comment and share with at least three people who you believe will find this episode valuable until next time thank you